So that's the new V8 engine, huh? Search me, Harry. I know as little about that engine or any other new model features as you do. Well, don't get too anxious, Ike. Judd's heading this way. He picked up the latest word on 58 features at the Chrysler Training Center in Detroit. <laughs> at ease, man. I just thought we ought to talk about this powerful new engine. It's got so much zip, it's going to surprise a lot of people. Which models is it used on, Judd? Well, it's made in two sizes, Harry. As a 350 cubic inch engine, you'll find it optional on Plymouth and standard on Dodge Custom Royal and Station Wagons and on the DeSoto Fire Sweep. Then, as a 361 cubic inch engine, you'll find it as standard in the Dodge D500 and the DeSoto Fire Dome, Fire Flight, and Adventurer models. Uh, both sizes have the same high compression ratio, 10 to 1, so they'll have to use premium fuel. 10 to 1? Wow, that's getting up there. What else is special? Well, the engine's a lot lighter. The block has a deeper design, so no torque converter housing adapter plate is needed. And since the block sides extend three inches below the crankshaft center line, there's a more rigid support for the crankshaft and new torque converter housing. Even the timing chain case is different. Yep, the chain case is recessed into the front of the block and is a stamp instead of a cast cover. The water jackets run the full length of the cylinders and there are drain plugs screwed in each side, just forward of the center. Glad you brought up the cooling system, Tech. You see, this system is more efficient yet uses a smaller volume of water. Water circulates from front to rear through the block. Then it rises to the cylinder heads and flows from the rear to the front and into the radiator. You'll find a distributor and ignition coil easier to get at, too. See? Up front, at the right corner. Hey, guess I can throw away my old boarding house reach, huh? They're right under my nose now. You can reach the externally mounted oil pump easily, too. It's down at the lower left front corner and is a rotor-type full-pressure pump. Both the pump and distributor are driven by a shaft that extends diagonally from the distributor to the pump. A gear mounted on the shaft meshes with an integral gear on the camshaft to supply the driving force. Hey, is this a new oil filter here on the oil pump? Yeah, Harry, it's a disposable type and it's easier to replace. But well, let's get back to the engine design features. For example, there are new lighter weight chrome alloy cast iron cylinder heads. Combustion chambers are a new wedge shaped design. Spark plugs enter the wide end of each chamber and are installed horizontally. Yeah, so I see, right below the exhaust manifold. Valves are arranged in line and the valve stem guides are cast in the heads. Intake valves are silicone chromium steel. The exhaust valves are nitrogen-treated manganese chromium nickel steel. So you get quieter, longer valve life. Rocker arms are improved, too. They're made of rigid, lightweight steel and are mounted on single rocker arm shafts. In between each pair of arms, spacers are used to soak up side thrust that comes from pushrod angularity. Five brackets support the shaft on each cylinder head. How about the pistons, Judd? They new too? Yep, pistons, pins, rings, and connecting rods are all new. Pistons are made of a tin-coated aluminum alloy. You'll notice a horizontal slot in the oil ring groove. And each piston has a cast-in steel band to control expansion. Two compression rings and one oil control ring are used. You'll also notice there are no lock rings to hold the piston pin in the piston. That's right. The pin is fitted in the piston, so it will slide through of its own weight. But it has an interference fit in the rod. Now, what do you mean, interference fit? The pinhole in the rod is from seven-tenths of a thousandth to one and two-tenths thousandths under the pin diameter. It makes the pin a tight press fit. I get it. Well, what else is new? What about valve tappets? Uh, they're hydraulic tappets, Harry. They won't need any adjustment. And there's more good news in the way of easier servicing, eh, Judd? Right, Tech. Those tappets can be removed 
without disturbing the intake manifold or cylinder heads. And the oil pan can be removed without moving the engine. Boy, that is good news, Judd. Hey, Judd, which way do rods and pistons come out on this engine? You take them out from the top, same as the other engines. Now, the engine oil capacity is four U.S. quarts. When you replace the filter, an extra quart is required. Well, how often will we have to change the oil? Every 5,000 miles for average service, more often under other conditions. And use service MS oil with viscosity to match the anticipated temperature range. Right. We'll follow that closely. Good. Replace the filter every 5,000 miles, too. Just uh, unscrew it from the base and discard the works, the entire filter and gasket. Clean the base thoroughly. Screw on the new filter and gasket until the gasket contacts the base. Then, give it an extra half turn by hand. Start the engine and check for leaks. Looks like duck soap. Pretty neat. Tuning up this new engine is easier, too. But because of the higher compression ratio, you'll have to watch those specifications. So use test equipment and don't guess at any settings. Yeah, fellas. Point gap settings, for instance, should be 15 to 18 thousandths. Use a dial indicator to be sure. Now this goes for both the single and the double point distributors. Double points? Yep, on Plymouth Fury, Dodge D500, and on the DeSoto Adventurer. Incidentally, cam dwell on single points is 29 to 32 degrees. On double points, total dwell is 36 to 39 degrees. Use a dwell meter, of course. Will do, Judd, will do. Good. Ignition timing's different, too. Use a light and set timing at 6 degrees before top dead center. Plus or minus 4 degrees. You mean you can range from top dead center to 10 degrees before? Yeah, depending on the grade of fuel and the operating conditions. But don't go beyond 10 degrees before. That can produce inaudible pre-ignition under some conditions and might cause trouble. Now, a word on spark plugs. This engine uses type AR32 and type AR42 plug, depending on the car model. This is a 14 millimeter short reach plug. Set the gap at 35 thousandths and check it with a round wire gauge. After cleaning spark plugs, Use new gaskets uh, when you reinstall them. Tighten them to 30 foot-pounds torque. New gaskets and 30 foot-pounds. Okay, got it. Good. Now get this. Somebody please turn this record. Then we'll talk about some other new 58 features. Let's see. We've covered some construction features of this new engine, the oil change, and some tune-up items. Idle speed setting ought to be next. You set your idle speed at 450 to 500 RPM. Always use a tachometer to check and adjust both idle speed and idle mixture settings. Okay, Judd, will do. But don't forget the manifold heat control valve, Judd. Right. We have to make sure that valve is free. If it isn't, performance and economy will suffer. So check heat valve operation each time you lubricate the car or tune up the engine. Use manifold heat control valve solvent on both ends of the shaft if you find it tends to stick. Sounds simple enough. We won't overlook it, Judd. Fine. Now, the cooling system of this new engine holds 16 U.S. quarts of water, 17 on cars with a hot water heater. A 160-degree thermostat is standard. Air-conditioned cars use a 180-degree thermostat as standard. A 14-pound pressure radiator cap is standard on all models. Got any questions? Well, not on what we've covered so far, Judd. But uh, I did hear that we might be having fuel injection on some of our cars. Anything to it? <laughs> yeah, Harry. Guess that's no secret now. Fuel injection, electronically controlled, will be available as optional equipment on certain models. In this picture, some covering equipment has been removed to show the details of the system. Well, that's quite a subject, Harry. But since we don't have a car with that equipment right now, let's wait until we get one, and then we'll talk about it, okay? Good idea, Tech. Then we'll really learn all there is to know about it. But right now, there are other things to talk about. 
We've got a brand new, constant control, full-time power steering system on our new line of cars. You mean there are more improvements in power steering? Improvements? A new unit, the man said. In fact, our engineers knocked themselves out in designing a power steering unit that really simplifies service on our part. Tech's so right. It's a more compact unit. There are fewer parts, and you can make the only two service adjustments required on the outside. No need to disassemble the unit. It almost sounds too good, Judd. It's mounted on the inside of the frame side rail as before, but it's accessible for adjustment from inside the engine compartment. There's an entirely new, slipper-type, constant displacement pump used on some models, too. It's bracket-mounted on the water pump housing and is belt-driven. Now, let's look at this steering unit. Mounted on top the gear housing is the pressure control valve housing and the steering valve body. The pressure control valve is a back pressure valve. Its function is to hold fluid pressure in the unit at a certain value. It also provides a return passage for displaced fluid. The steering valve body contains the steering valve, a spool-type valve which directs fluid to the piston for a right or left turn. You can move the valve body on the housing if necessary. That's how you adjust for equal assistance on each turn. Good point, Tack. We'll come to that adjustment in a minute. Now, the worm shaft operates inside the piston on two ball circuits. The piston travels up and down on the worm shaft. Pressure areas are on each side of the piston flange. These teeth on the sector shaft mesh with the rack teeth in the outer surface of the piston. An adjusting screw and lock nut control backlash. And we'll talk about that adjustment in a minute, too. The steering valve is operated by a pivot lever. As the steering wheel turns, there's a slight endwise movement of the worm shaft, just enough to move the lower end of the pivot lever. The upper end of the pivot lever moves the steering valve, which directs fluid to one side of the piston flange or the other for a right or left turn. Sounds like a simplified gear, all right. What about adjustments? You said they were easy. That's right, they are. Take the backlash adjustment, for example. Loosen the lock nut and turn the adjusting screw out to bring in a little backlash. Then turn the screw in until backlash disappears. Finally, turn the screw in three-eighths to one-half turn to preload the teeth. Then, tighten the lock nut. Ah, yeah, simple enough. How about the other adjustment you mentioned? The uh, steering valve adjustment? Sure. But before you make that adjustment, you should bleed the system to be sure all air is worked out of the fluid. Here's how to do that. Remove the cover or filler cap from the reservoir and be sure there's enough fluid in the reservoir. Then start the engine. Get someone to turn the steering wheel from extreme left to extreme right slowly. Watch for bubbles in the fluid in the reservoir. Keep turning the wheel until no more bubbles appear. Then, add more fluid if needed, and install the cover or cap on the reservoir. Then you're ready to make the adjustment, right? Yep. Loosen the valve body mounting screws one at a time and retighten them to seven foot-pounds. Tap lightly on the valve body end plug or on the pressure control valve body screws to shift the body up or down on the housing. Uh, take it easy. You want to move the body just a hair at a time and then check to see if it has corrected the condition. That's right. And when you get it in the right position, tighten the mounting screws to 15 foot-pounds. Yeah, that sounds pretty good, Judd. What else you got to talk about? I ought to tell him about the new sure grip differential, Judd. Uh-oh. That sounds like one of those drive-to-both-wheels type of differentials. That what it is? Yep. I haven't got one to show you, but I do have a picture of it. When one wheel tends to spin on ice or in sand, clutch plates automatically engage and transfer torque to the wheel that isn't spinning. So you get torque applied to both wheels, and the car pulls itself out of its difficulty. 
I sure want to learn more about that. I wondered how that type of differential works. Well, you'll get plenty of time to learn about it as soon as we get one in stock. Now, here's something else I want to mention. Power flight and torque flight automatic transmissions in some 1958 models will have provision for water cooling the transmission fluid. Wasn't that idea used before on some models? Yes, it was, Harry. But this new arrangement routes the fluid from the torque converter through external tubes and through a coil in the lower tank of the radiator. Yeah, that sounds like a good deal, Judd. What else is new? Well, you'll notice some engines will use a new model AFB carburetor. It's a reduced height unit. The major castings are aluminum, with the throttle body cast integral with the main body. It also has other new features, for example, a new location for the step-up rods and pistons. The rods, pistons, and springs are accessible for service without removing the air horn or removing the carburetor from the engine. Why, if it means less work, I'm all for it. Anything else new? Judd, uh, tell the boys about the new headlamp setup. Oh, yes. Dual headlamps that were used on some models last year are standard equipment on all 1958 models. The beam aiming procedures are the same as before. These are just the highlights. You'll find more details in the reference book. Good, and we'll sure study that book, too. That's a boy, Harry. The sooner we understand the service procedures that apply to our new cars, the sooner we'll get on the ball and keep our customers happy. Come <laughs> on.